So Tom has shared with you a bit of our heart for the church. Um, I'm just going to say a few words for those who, when Tom was talking about the four domains and all of the the pressures and the expectations, the demands and the priorities that, that come with those and that often uh, end up competing with one another, if, if that felt like your job, um, then I'm just here to say that there are people who understand you, uh, who feel your pain, um, and that part of the intent here is to create a space where you can find other people who uh, are doing the same thing and, and wrestling with those things. And, and just to talk a little bit about how for us, Missions 3.0, uh, became a way out of that kind of huge game of whack-a-mole, which is really kind of what your job becomes, of trying to deal with the, the latest crisis, the latest opportunity, the latest priority within the church, um, personal preferences and inspiration and all the things that kind of tend to govern decision-making in the life of a local church, apart from a, a strategic uh, assessment of the needs of the world and a, and a plan for addressing it. And, uh, and so that's personally for me what Missions 3.0 became was, was a way of talking about a way out of just managing the tensions and, and trying to navigate all that competition, a way to begin to integrate those priorities in a way that, that might produce a more comprehensive strategy for our mission work and, and not just a response to each of those, those four pressures. Um, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. Um, hopefully it's reassuring to, to hear that this isn't rocket science, um, but it is leadership. And leadership often just is taking things we really already know and just drilling down enough to make them practical. And so some of the things that we found were most important, um, you've already heard about, but things, language does matter. It's extremely important how you talk about what you do. And, and, and there may be language that you need to leave behind, but there may be language you need to figure out um, for yourself and in your context. For, um, for example, uh, a lot of us uh, use terminology like relief, betterment, and development, and that's become pretty common in churches. We found it important to go back and be even more specific than that and, and to begin to talk about specifically emergency relief and individual betterment and community development just because that helped people understand that relief might be beneficial and even necessary, but in an emergency. That it does offer the, 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 the solution of, of stability to somebody who's in crisis. And that individual betterment is, is a good thing, but it typically only affects individuals and at best individual families the tutoring and training and all the things we do to equip people who are ready to, to take some initiative to rise above their own circumstances, we want to be responsive to that, but it typically um, is beneficial to individuals and families, and at the end of the day, um, doesn't typically uh, affect an entire community. And we wanted it to be clear that when we talk about development, we're talking about something distinct from that, that is really about the community that requires talking about infrastructure and capacity and, and dealing specifically with, with producers who create opportunities for other people and, and ultimately affect the quality of life for an entire community. Missions 3.0, um, Tom's, we've talked about that, we've alluded to the fact that, that it came out of trying to figure out how to talk to a church about what they had been doing, but to introduce the need for change in a way that didn't just um, shut people down or, or get me thrown out. Um, and so, yeah, talking about uh, software upgrades, uh, as Tom alluded to, um, suggests that, that the software itself is not the problem, but it, al it always needs an upgrade. And an upgrade is designed to make it stronger, to incorporate learning, to fix mistakes. And, um, and so looking at this church that had a, had a very missional uh, theology, a very missional identity, and, and was determined to live that out in the world, um, it, just, uh, it just so happened that uh, around our 20th year, we were kind of reflecting on that and realized that, that we had expressed that identity in fairly distinct ways over the, the two decades of our life, and, and that for the first 10 years, we been expressing that primarily financially. We had raised a lot of money, and we had continued to create ways for people to give money. Um, and, uh, and then in the second decade, we'd committed ourselves to figuring out ways to get our people more directly involved in, in our mission work. 
And looking back on that, it, it seemed natural then to talk about that as, as 1.0 um, is really about mobilizing money and that uh, in that process, that there's something natural in us about doing that. When, that when God's impulse for good uh, inspires us to want to do something, we seem to be wired to give first and typically give money. Um, and so it's important in the local church to have an opportunity for people to take that first step. And as a result, um, I think it's fair to say that, that the church over time had been very successful in training a congregation to give sacrificially. And, and that's a good thing. That's part of spiritual maturity. Um, and so to be able to say that's, that's 1.0, that's, that's, that's the foundation of this entire operating system. And yet it, it needed an upgrade. And, and we had to make a shift to engaging people. Um, and, and, and that revolved a lot around providing positive volunteer experiences. Um, but it, all of those with the intent of helping people, helping put people's hearts in harm's way. Uh, exposing them to the things in our world that break God's heart and, and then being prepared to help them figure out what to do with that as they, as they hopefully grew spiritually um, out of that experience. Um, but being able to talk about that as Missions 2.0 affirmed uh, its value uh, over time. There's, there became no doubt in the minds of anybody that encountered our church in any, in any way, shape, or form that hands-on service and, and living out the gospel uh, in your daily life is part and parcel with the Christian life, that, that that's just what it means uh, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And yet, uh, to talk about it as Missions 2.0 still implied that there was room for, for improvement. And that, that allowed us then to start talking about, well, what would the next upgrade require? And, and then the language we, we began to, to, to focus on there was, um, and Tom was, was brilliant in this, was uh, the film The Blind Side uh, became a, a critical tool in, in bringing some language to what that, why that um, upgrade was necessary, why um, it wasn't just that there was a better future ahead, but that here was no longer acceptable and, and we needed to, to move forward. Because we were able to show then that that all of the money and all the people that we had mobilized were going primarily into relief and betterment. And, and while those are essential things, um, the sum effect of those tends to be just to provide an exit strategy from impoverished communities for the best and the brightest. That, that people who receive that relief and, and ultimately take the initiative to avail themselves of that betterment ultimately end up uh, getting out and while that's a good thing and that, that provides great heartwarming anecdotal stories, uh, what it leaves behind is a community that's still in poverty and in fact is now depleted of the folks uh, who had the greatest promise for, for contribution. And so really beginning to talk in that language helped people sort of step back and say, oh, well, of course that's not what we wanted and, and allowed us to begin to talk about what it would take to affect an entire community. So language was absolutely critical. For us then, it became important to, have, to offer a clear definition of success. As churches were really good at inspiring and evocative language, um, we spent 20 years mobilizing all kinds of, of resources toward transforming communities. But you can, you can fit a lot under the umbrella of transforming a community. And, and it wasn't until we really spent the time wrestling um, to create a, a statement very much uh, like the, the one Tom talked about last night, something more practical to define what a transformed community might even look like. That it might actually be a place that could provide its own citizens, its own residents, its own uh, families, the means and opportunity to fulfill their potential without dependence on outside charitable resources. That's still very broad, but it's so much more specific and tangible and, and ultimately, we hope, measurable. That gives us a context then for knowing what, what to say yes to and what to say no to. And one of the things that it won't surprise you that becomes critical in all of this we found is the ability just to say no. And to say that politely, but clearly and firmly. Um, unfortunately, the church, I believe, has, has become rather apologetic for having a purpose. Um, and, and we find ourselves sort of, um, sort of captive to the expectations uh, of our, our communities and the world around us. And so 
having a purpose, having a strategy, um, is nothing to apologize for. It gives you some clarity about what you, why you're there and, and what you're there to do and what you bring to the table, what the value proposition that, that Tom just spelled out. To be able to say that gives people something then to, to decide whether or not they are interested in that or not and, and whether they're willing to engage in a relationship with you or if you're just their volunteer temp agency or their ATM um, for what they wanted to do in the community anyway. We found that one of the most critical things uh, in this work was was the willingness to create space for a, a new kind of leader, that um, our churches are full of folks who are masterful at project management, of uh, volunteer management, of, of doing relief and betterment. Um, we, we do that well, and, and we know the systems that it takes to do that, and we, we organize ourselves well for that. Um, but what I, we found is that there are a lot of people in our congregations who don't see a role for themselves in that, who are inspired by their relationship with God, want to be a part of his mission in the world, want to change the world, um, but don't see the church as the place to do that. Uh, as we would say, don't really believe the church is where they can bring their A-game. And so they're looking to either philanthropy or, or business as, as the places where they can ask the really critical questions about what it's going to take to, to, um, to change the world. And, and they'll, they'll come to church for their spiritual growth. They'll come to church to, to support, to be with their families. They'll come to church to, to give out of their, their leftovers. Um, but when it comes to really asking the hard questions about what it's going to take to make this world better for more people, um, those answers they assume are being um, worked out elsewhere. And that the church just is not where that kind of complexity is, is, is taken on. And so being willing to create places, and that often means new structures, new, new groups, new, not necessarily you know, shoehorning them into to the existing uh, decision-making bodies, but finding ways to, to create space for them um, to talk about economics, economic development, um, and, uh, and all of the other things that it takes uh, in a community. And then, as, as Tom alluded to before, it, it takes people who then, in the midst of that, are, can resist either-or propositions um, and are willing to help people... Um, embrace the complexity and, and often the continuum of responses that are required to, to achieve a more holistic and comprehensive strategy. And so while on the one hand uh, we've used books like Toxic Charity and When Helping Hurts and, and events like this to kind of stir the pot and get people asking more critical questions, uh, when, when, when that really begins to resonate with folks and they really begin to see that, oh my gosh, we may have actually been hurting people in our efforts to help them, then there's often a tendency to just push back on that and, and want to kind of demonize and, and bash everything that we've done before. Um, and, and so while on the one hand you may be the person leading into those conversations, trying to stir them up, at the end of the day you may be the one saying, yeah, but um, the last thing we need here is a bunch of development zealots who are going to just shame us all for the things that we've done really well. Our problem is not that we aren't making a difference in the world. Our problem is that we don't know if we're making a difference that lasts. Our problem isn't that relief and betterment are bad and that we're no good at doing it. Our problem is we don't know when to stop. And in fact, if, if I read Matthew 25 right, I think it was Jesus himself who said, if we're not doing relief, we may be going to hell. And, and, you know, so sometimes it's just reminding the church of those kind of things so that we don't end up um, exchanging a lopsided approach for, for another one. So those are just some of the things that we've learned along the way. And, um, and together, they've, they've offered us, in the midst of all of those tensions and all of those competing priorities and just the, the messiness of, of trying to lead mission in a local church, a framework for decision-making a, way, a, a road map forward into the complexity without it being overwhelming, and, uh, and a way to frame a new story, a new story of the impact that the church could have 
And we talk about it as, you know, the it that we want to be able to point people to, to say, this is what the future could look like. And so for those of you who, who live in that tension, part of the intent of this is, again, to create a space where you can find other people who, who are doing that. Um, and if that's what you're doing, or if that's where you want to lead, that, that you know that there's a place you can find other people doing it. So thank you.